Hello, welcome to the Manchester campus for today's lightning talks as part of North Coders fifth anniversary celebrations. I'm Doug, I'm one of the tutors at North Coders and I've got a selection of staff, uh, students and alumni with a selection of uh, really interesting talks tonight. So without further ado, I will be passing over to uh, Romy with a talk entitled, Don't Be Alarmed. Hello, Romy. Hi. Sorry, I was on mute. Hi. Ready yeah. to go? I am ready to go. Let me share All right. this. Let me make sure it's the right screen. Cool, hopefully you can see my presentation. That's not the one I wanted. I wanted this one. No. There we go. Technical difficulties abated. Cool. So welcome to my talk. Don't be alarmed when it comes to monitoring and automated service alerts. Um, so do be alarmed when you need to be is really what I mean from this talk. Today, I'll be giving you a brief introduction to monitoring and alarming your production infrastructure. So let's make up an e-commerce example. Let's imagine we want to build a website that sells stuff and delivers it to customers. What does this site need to do? It needs to list all of the items that we want to sell, display whether an item's in stock or not, allow a user to create an account to check purchases, save delivery addresses and pay. Um, you want to track dispatch and delivery. Um, there's probably a load more things that the website could or should do, but we are time limited. So I put these in a vague priority order um, and you may feel like you would prioritize things differently, but this is the basis of a basic e-commerce site. So here's our super cool e-commerce site, which I've called Skis. Uh, it's a catchy name. Architecture. So we could have built this like in a monolithic style or a microservice style. Um, dropping some buzzwords in here for you. Um, and just for those of you that don't know what they are, I'll do a quick diagram and explanation. So monolithic, you usually have um, everything kept in the same repository, um, all of your code, your individual services, etc. Um, and it's all hooked up to maybe a big database with lots of different tables in it. So you can see there's lots of different tables in my database. I've got a user service, a stock service, a delivery service, all in one big repo here. And then I'm interacting with my user interface or my front end. Um, so things can be interconnected and unexpectedly reliant on each other when they're in a monolithic application. Um, and then we have the microservices architecture. So as you can see, um, there's exactly what it says on the tin. There's a bunch of individual smaller services. Um, there's multiple repositories, one for each. Um, and the code does not rely on any other service. They're completely independent of each other, but you can make requests um, between the two services if you needed to. Um, so in this case, each service has a simple database. And that's basically the microservices. So why are they the best thing since sliced bread? Disclaimer, don't force microservices when there's no business need as it can make your life more complicated. Um, but they're good because they're highly maintainable and testable. They're loosely coupled, so um, you can do stuff on each individual service um, and it won't mess with anything else that you're doing elsewhere. They're independently deployable. So if you've only made changes to your user service, you don't have to redeploy your entire stack and they can often be owned by a small team. So you might have a user team, a stock team and another team all working completely independently, not having to worry about merge conflicts or anything when they do work. But anyway, I digress. Um, imagine we've built an MVP, that's minimum viable product for anyone that doesn't know, another buzzword for you. Um, and so this is our site, we've deployed it using a cloud service provider of your choice. It's working at first, but we did a bit of dodgy code to get it live, we were in a bit of a rush. Um, we're constantly working on new features, trying to take, tackle tech debt, scalability, all the good stuff. So what happens when stuff breaks? We need to know about it. We want to know about it before our customers, ideally, because this stops them complaining, stops us losing reputation as a company, uh, stops us losing current and future custom, because if something went wrong the last time you used a website, you're probably not going to hurry back. Um, we also want to know as soon as things start to look dodgy. So before our services are down completely, um, there could be signs that something is going wrong um, and it's degrading progressively. So we want to know about that. We want to prevent loss of data um, and we want to be able to fix stuff before disaster happens. 
Um, the best way of preventing a disaster is being proactive, not reactive. If you're being reactive, that means that the disaster has already happened. So enter monitoring and alerts. We can use a third party or an independent service to query our services and infrastructure to check that they are running as expected. So if any part of our infrastructure is down or degraded in performance, we can rely on that independent monitoring to tell us. Um, it's really important that our monitoring service isn't within our infrastructure, because if our services are down, our monitoring service um, would also be down and therefore wouldn't be much use to us. So back to skis. Uh, time equals money. Downtime equals no money in the e-commerce world. Uh, so every second counts. Um, think about how long you would want to wait on a website to buy an item that is also available on hundreds of other websites, but maybe for a different price. If you can't buy it because the site is down or you have to wait for the page to load, you're probably going to buy it elsewhere. So here's a monolithic example. Someone deletes the user um, section of the code base by accident. Like Stuff like this happens. Um, so without any monitoring, we know that something has gone wrong because someone's deleted the user section but this blissfully unaware developer does not. Um, if all of our code is in the same repository and interdependent, it might take us a while, A, to be told by the customer that our service isn't working as expected, um, B, to find where the issue is in our complicated monolithic repo, um, and then more time to actually do the fixing. So our service has logs, and those will contain information that our service is down, but unless someone is looking at those logs at that particular time when the service goes down, we aren't going to know that there's an issue. So see blissfully aware, unaware developer and sad user. So ta-da, enter our monitoring service. So it's sitting up here in the cloud. Um, and basically what it will do is ma make some HTTP requests or um, scan some logs if we've allowed it access to our service logs. Um, and we can set it up to ping us when something unexpected happens. So it's constantly pinging our service going, are you working, are you working, are you working? And as soon as it gets a message saying, ah, no, it, it pings the developer. So um, as devs, we are less happy because we have to fix a problem, sad times, but the customer will be happy because we know that uh, there's a pr problem and we're gonna quickly fix that. Um, when it comes to microservices, someone accidentally uh, deletes the user service, whoops. Um, if the user service is down, or in this case does not exist, uh, there's gonna be some unexpected behavior on the front end. And similarly to before, as developers, we probably have our heads deep in um, some new feature code and we're blissfully unaware. So again, pop in a, a cloud monitoring service. Um, it's constantly running the background, making periodic checks to see that our service is responding to basic requests. Um, you can alter how often um, it actually pings the service to check that it's up and running and how often it will check the logs. Um, depending on what your use case is, because you might have um, an e-commerce site that you want to be up 100% of the time because people want to be buying 100% of the time. But if you've got like an internal service that's just being used by internal staff and isn't public facing, maybe five people use it, you might not want to check it so often. Uh, but yeah, we get pinged. They say, hey, this service isn't responding at all. Uh, so then the developer knows that they can either roll back to the last working release or patch a fix. So why is monitoring good? Health checks tell us instantly when our service is down. We can see when service performance is degrading and catch it before it goes down. You can create dashboards based on the monitoring data. This is really good for reporting to a business saying like, look, we're getting loads and loads of traffic. Um, analysis, hmm, we're getting loads of traffic on this day. So maybe we should increase our services on that day and put some more support in line. Um, and also it helps us see, ah, oh, we're getting huge backlog in this particular service and loads of random errors. So it allows us to put more feature work um, and technical debt improvements into our sprints and makes them more aware of it. So the possibilities are endless. So alarming, now we're monitoring our service, we can set thresholds to instantly notify, notify us when things are going badly. So we need to think about what we want to be alerted, what is serious enough to disturb us. You don't wanna get pinged every five minutes for something that isn't serious, um, then when something bad does happen, you won't notice. So boy cry, cry wolf kind of situation. So the main purpose of our site is to sell stuff. People come to the site, see what's for sale. Therefore, our highest priority is that customers see what is for sale, and then next they wanna know what's in stock so they can buy it. Without that, we have no business. So we want to measure the rate of kind of successful HTTP calls to our stock service. So those would be 200 HTTP status codes. Um, we can do this by counting the number of non-successful codes 
over a period of time. Uh, we could set up an alert if the percentage of non-successful messages rises above the threshold. So here I've got how many 200 responses we've got over time, and here we've set a threshold. So if we've got a low amount of 200 responses, this is bad, bad, we're in the alarm zone. And then once it's over that threshold, we're safe again. So we would be getting pinged every five minutes or how, however often you wanted to be pinged in this bit. Cool. Uh, we also might want to check the speed it takes our service to return information. So you don't want to be waiting five minutes for a page to load. Um, so we can check what our average time to respond is um, over time. And so we can see, ah, something bad happened here. It, suddenly our service was degrading. And we can be alerted before it fully outages as well, which is helping us be pro proactive rather than reactive. So why is alarming good? Uh, you can get instant notification of issues by email, Slack, or on a customer facing status page. So customers can go and check on something independently and say, oh, their service is down. Uh, you can contact different people depending on the type of alarm. So a user team for the user accounts might get notified when the user service is down. So you don't distract other people working on the teams when it's not necessarily an issue related to them. Uh, you can also get um, product owners or managers or engineering managers contacted when there's a significant outage. So tools to do this. Amazon Cloudwatch is a tool that um, I've used. So some of you may have heard of AWS. If you haven't already, um, they basically make loads of services that try and make our lives easier, um, as well as a ginormous amount of data warehouses where they are physically storing data for you. And that's what we mean by cloud. Um, it's basically some, a big company storing stuff for you. Um, so these are the kind of things that you can see um, on uh, <laughs> on, I think I've run over time. So these are the kind of things that you can see. I'll just skip through these slides. Uh, this is a kind of uh, machine learning that um, these services like Cloudwatch can do for you. So they'll learn what your expected rates are. And then if you go outside of that boundary, um, they can tell you to um, that you're an alarm and send you notifications. And then there's some also really cool visual data visualization tools like Grafana. So you can make stuff look way prettier than the Cloudwatch stuff. Um, and yeah, there's, are you alarmed? Hopefully not, um, but I might have bored you to sleep or you might be interested. Um, I've got a load of links um, on the next page that I can send to everyone. But yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you so Thank much, Remy. And I think we have a question immediately from Liam, one of the other talkers. No? Oh, yes, it's, it's not another question. Um, from the bottom, I believe. Oh, he's commented again saying he has another one. But I also have two, so either of us can ask one. Ask away. <laughs> cool. Um, do you want me to go, Doug? You go first, Liam, yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, really interesting. Uh, I thought I really liked the idea of this thing being decoupled from your actual um, services so that it isn't interfered with and kind of act independently on it. I think that's a really cool idea. Um, I was just curious as to if the idea of this monitoring system sits um, kind of like between uh, the client making the requests uh, and your your service in the back end um, or um, yeah, wherever, whatever systems you have, do you, is there any kind of like evidence of it putting any weight or any extra strain on those requests being made? Is there like tangible differences it makes in slowing the, the responses down perhaps, or is it kind of pretty negligible? Um, it's, it's pretty negligible. Um, it depends how often I suppose that you need to check it and what your systems can cope with. Because if you've got a big system that's, that can, it is designed to cope with like hundreds of thousands of requests a second, like an extra request every like minute isn't gonna bother it. Um, so that's something that you consider when you're um, actually designing how often you want to monitor your system. Um, so if you, like I said, when you've got um, an internal system that maybe only five people are using inside your company and it's not actually a public facing, customer facing thing, then if it's down for half an hour, someone might not have used it for half an hour, so they don't really mind. So you might only wanna check it once every 30 minutes. Um, but if you're like a, a ticketing website, like Glastonbury Sales, you need to have millions of people hitting your service in yeah. milliseconds. So you need to know that it's up that whole time as well. So yeah, it's, it's all about the scalability of what you've actually set your configuration of your services to, to accept. Cool, thank you. Amazing. 
Thanks very much. I have one for myself. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. If the if the uh, alerting service is tied to the infrastructure, if the infrastructure is changed or kind of altered in a way, is there like a big job to change the alerting service itself as well? Does it need to be um, maintained alongside the, the infrastructure? Yeah, it does. Um, if you've got something integrated, it can be easier. So we, at my work, we use AWS for pretty much everything. So that's mm -hmm. why we're using CloudWatch because we've got access to other services uh, more more easily within that. Um, but it's if it's a massive architectural change, then you're going to be wanting to alert on different stuff anyway. So it's always going to have to be a bit of side work that you're going to have to do. Oh. Um, if you are just chain adding endpoints or adding something, then it's more more like you just have to add an alert for what you want to alert on that. As long as you're not changing um, kind of how you access that service, it should be okay. Gotcha. Great. Any more questions from the chat? Can't see any at the moment. Um, and you showed like a great uh, well preference between microservices and these monolithic. <laughs> uh, you work with both in, in your in your line of work. Um, yeah, I have worked. I have worked with both, um, and I think when you're working on something that is really complex and does a lot of stuff, um, a lot of the time you want it to be separated out because then you then you know that you're not kind of you're not m meshing things together that that need to be completely separate, and you don't want the logic to interact with each other. Um, and I know that when we've started building something before a Greenfield project, um, it was it starts off monolithic and then you realize that you want to decouple stuff. It's so much harder to do it that way than to try and separate your concerns and, and try and kind of modularize in your design at the beginning. It's, it's, gotcha, it's, right. Yeah, it's going to save you a lot of time if you do that in the beginning. Amazing. And Cool, great, thank you very much. And I think with that, we'll move on to the next talk. Cool, thank you. So next up, we have one of our current backend students, Bhavna. Hello. Um, Hello. I can't, like, I can't uh, following that lecture is quite a task to do. <laughs> Romy did so well. well. Lightning Talks, uh, as a North Coast tradition, is very casual. We, it can be pitched at whatever topic or level you want. So I'm, re is, I'm really interested in hearing your one. So please, whenever you're ready. You feel like a kindergarten's version of everything after that. <laughs> well, good. It's pitched at my level, then. It's good. <laughs> oh, um, OK. Whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and take it away. I'm just about to start. OK. So um, I'm talking about, sorry, I've gone too far now. Um, I'm talking about something that is new to me. So I thought, can you all hear me? Hello? 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 Hi. Sorry. I am currently talking about something that's very new to me. Um, my husband introduced me to this concept called OHOT, where uh, generally it's sort of like um, you're talking about a concept that didn't exist even 10 years ago. So it's almost like uh, very, very new where people are starting to think about how to take, uh, how to, provide this service or provide a framework or rules to let everybody take this into, uh, I mean, like take, apply this into all the applications that they're building. So anybody who has used the internet would have come up across a page that is similar to this, where you would be uh, probably like redirected, like 
I mean, like if you're like me, you wouldn't want to sit and fill up your details every single time you are trying to um, log into a website. So this is a classic example of a redirect page where it just says, okay, we are here. And if you are already on Gmail or one of these other partnership webs, I mean, like servers or services that you're using, then you can use their credentials that you have used to log into their account. And you can get in to our, like, let us use all of that to let other people know what's happening. So this is where OHOT comes in. Uh, OAuth is a framework, like it's a set of rules for idea assertion and authorization, and that's all it is. There's no, everything that comes after this is pretty much, it's sort of like, let's say you want to follow, a, I mean, you want to be a British citizen, you have to follow certain rules. And that is all this is. This is an authority giving you a certain number of rules to follow. So in OAuth, um, OAuth, you have four types of grants. The user authorization grant, which al almost all of us come across. Then you have a client authorization grant type, which is something that happens between server, server, I mean like services to services. This has nothing to do with the user as you at the endpoint. And then you have something called the implicit and grant point, which is terribly, terribly bad from a security point of view. And um, the resource owner grant type, which is again, similar to the implicit grant type, but it has a few things that are a bit more uh, customizable. But again, implicit grant type and resource owner grant types are really, really um, like almost a no-no when you think about trying to share your information online. Now, some of the OAuth terminologies that we come across, I mean, like they are used and almost like, this took a long time for me to actually understand and go through because they use specific stuff for specific things. Resource owner is you as a person at the end point who's making the request. And then the client would be, the client, for example, if you have Airbnb that you go into and they make a request to Google or whoever you want to use credentials from. So the client would be Airbnb at that point. And then you have an authorization server. This can be part of the resource server, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be. Some services which are too small tend to use a third party authorization server. Now, an authorization server is more or less an authority that gives you papers. For example, if you want to travel to another country from Britain, you take your passport with you. The person on the other end sitting, with Im sitting at immigration doesn't have to trust you as a person, but they look at your papers they look at your passport and say, oh, you're a British citizen. It's issued by an authority in Britain. So that is what they trust. So this is what an authentication server essentially does. Now the resource server is what you want the resources from. From when you develop, or like when you ask as a client for resources, if you're on Airbnb and you ask for Google to share its contacts with you, like as a user, you want Google to share all its contacts so you can send advertisement messages or some kind of message on behalf of you to your contacts, then this would become your resource server. Like Google will become your resource server and Airbnb will become the client. So the redirect URL is very interesting because this is something that none of us see happening in the front. It's almost like a back channel thing where certain countries, for example, just to bring it into more um, current day um, scenarios, 
like there are some countries that you can travel to without a visa. Uh, so if we take something like that into consideration, now they look at your passport and they authorize you saying, okay, so this is an understanding made between the two countries. It has nothing to do with you as a citizen of the country or the other person, but it's already made between the two countries and the authority sitting behind. So this kind of agreement that they have is like, uh, it uh, helps with letting you know that like you take the passport to them and then they just let you in based on this. So the redirect URL is almost like this piece of passport or this piece of thing that one of the authorities has given you and you take it to them. So this happens behind. So when you click on something like, uh, I mean, when we go further, I will explain a bit more. And then you have response type. This response type and scope are um, different types of responses you get back and the consent authorization will be something similar to this like the response type will have a scope and consent authorization from the client so it's um, almost like working hand in hand and then you have the client id and client secret client secret is a secret like for example, if you have a mailbox, anybody can post things into it. But without a key, you cannot open this mailbox. It's similar to that. And then you have an authorization code, which I will explain in a little bit, and the access token. This is a very simplified, like a, sw a swim lane diagram of what OAuth is. You have your application. It sends a request to the client, the, authorization server and then so you as a person are using this application to send the request this application is sending the request on your behalf and everything in dotted lines is what happens behind on the back channel so the authorization code is sent back to your application and the exchange token so this is like a very simplified version of what happens before like uh, almost like a very, very um, stylized version of what an OAuth server does. And then it I'm like, so basically, when you look at the different types of, um, like as a client, this is another way of depicting the same diagram that was swim lane. And this is just the flow of data, the way it goes. So the resource server, and the authorization server have an agreement before, like with the client saying, okay, and they give this uh, like almost like a, a, a key to the client. So um, let me, like, it's just, I, I thought it would be interesting to see different ways of depicting. So there are so many different ways out there of depicting the exact same diagram. When you look at it, it's all the same thing. So now we're going to go into my very kindergarten version of how it looks. So you have a client, which will be you, and whatever website you're using. And then you're, you go on to Airbnb, and you say, okay, I want to create an account. Now they say, okay, let me use, I see you already have a Google account. Do you want me to use your Google credentials? And at that point you say, oh yes, I want to use the Google credentials to log into Airbnb. I don't want to sit and put all my details over again. So at that point, the client sends a redirect to Google. Like this is what, would have happened behind the scenes. So this redirect will already contain one of the client's keys. So it's almost like saying, okay, so I have a key. I'm not just a person, like random person asking for this, and this is my key, and you attach all of that, and then you send a redirect. So when you send a redirect, the Google sends back an authentication page saying, are you sure you want to do this? Is this your, you are the one doing, you are the one asking for it. 
And at this point, the client says, yes. And then he enters the credential or they enter the credentials of like the username and the password to say, yes, this is me. At that point, Google sends back a message saying the authentication was successful and it sends the consent required. So this consent is what it is that like it's very granular, almost like you can consent to pretty much everything. Like this is where you click on, do you want Google to share all the contacts or do you want Google to let Airbnb only take a look at these contacts? You can, as a client, specify how much authority you want to give Airbnb. Now, after this, you send like a you you send a response with all of these things put into it back to Google. When all of this is done, after you're done selecting whatever you want with the response, uh, Google sends back a redirection page or a redirection URL with like a reference token in attached to this. So if you watch really close at the URL, like the URL uh, bar, you will actually take a look at all of this happening in the background. Now, after all of this is done, you take that reference token. So Google takes this reference token, wraps it up nicely and sends it to Airbnb. Now, because of all of this, and this reference token being sent to Airbnb, you don't have to have this process happening every time you go onto Airbnb. At the end, like when you look at it, I hope this kind of makes it a bit clear. I am um, sort of quite a nervous public speaker, so please excuse me. <laughs> um, the client now, Yelp, or Airbnb or Google or I mean like uh, any of them, like even within Google, if you want to use certain micro services that they have, they probably will be having the same kind of channels happening or same kind of processes happening on the background. So you go through the, this is just the code flow, like the code, the way the code works for the whole thing. The dotted lines are all the back channel code and the front lines are solid arrows. So when you look at the solid arrows, these are these happen on your browser. So it's not necessarily the most secure way of handling information. This is why you need that secret code and all the tokens being passed on a back channel where it's not like easily published to everybody. Thank you. That's about it. These are my credits. Muted. Thank you so much, Bhavna. It's so fascinating to see something that I personally do, like log in, in and out of these uh, sites using my Google credentials, using Twitter, using my GitHub credentials. And you know, I, I click and don't really think about it. It just works. So it's really fascinating to see it all illuminated like this. Uh, we've got a message from Paul, one of our lecturers, saying that he wishes his handwriting was as neat as yours in that little paper diagram that you, you wrote. Uh, really, really nice. And uh, even some of our project team students saying that they're working on some authentication uh, using Google or Facebook in their final project. So really informative for them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I, I must ask, I, I kind of approached you about giving a lightning talk not two weeks ago. Have you kind of been researching OAuth in, in just that time, in, in two weeks, or is it something you've been looking at for a bit longer? Um, it's, I must give a lot of credit to my husband explaining a lot of things to me. I am very nervous when I'm speaking in front of a crowd, so I tend to be quite jittery. But I hope I got all of the information out properly in terms of like, I'm sure I've made some errors in the way I've put it across because um, it, it's interesting. Like I have researched security is such an integral part of our life now. So I think it's very important for us to, as 
I mean, like whether you're building a really small web page or really big application, it's so important to take a look at where are the loopholes. And I think that's where this comes in handy. Mm. Well, thank you so much. Uh, really fascinating to hear. And uh, cool. Thank you. Thank so let's you. move on. Next, we have Elijah, who has a talk on virtual influences. Hello, Elijah. Get you on. How's it going? It's going good. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, cool. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about virtual influences. So, uh, brilliant. Hopefully, I can get my uh, slides going. All right. Okay. So, virtual influences. What is an influencer? So, influencers make money from having big Instagram and YouTube followings. Usually, that'll be at least a hundred thousand followers. Um, some are already celebrities who have huge fan followings. Some become famous online and obtain sponsorship deals with companies who want their products to be advertised. So an influencer's popularity is usually based on the type of content that they produce, which is often related to an aspirational lifestyle. So it'll quite often be fashion, fitness, makeup, travel, music. Sorry, just or... to interrupt, Elijah. Did you have slides you were sharing? We can't see them. Yeah, the sorry. Uh, oh, I haven't shared it. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you, Doug. Um, I knew I was missing something. There we go. There should be a share button. Yeah, there, there we go. What an amateur. Share screen. There we go. Sorry about that, everyone. Just looking right. at my face. Right. This will be a bit more interesting. Um, cool. Can you see that now? Yeah, cool. OK. Um, so yeah, quite often, it will just be um, lifestyle related things, so fashion, fitness, makeup, travel, music, or sometimes just wealthy people posting about their lives. Um, so below here, we've got some pictures of some human influencers, but the rest of the people that we'll see, uh, with the exception of Kim Kardashian, are all CGI. So what is a virtual influencer? So a virtual influencer is very similar to a real life influencer, except they are CGI identities constructed by companies in order to generate advertising revenue. So virtual influencers have on average twice the engagement value of their human counterparts, and they're able to respond immediately to the latest trends at the click of a button. So in terms of advertising, they're very useful. So anything a human influencer can do, a virtual influencer can do with more control, glance value, and engagement, according to Christopher Travers from the dystopianly named Virtual Humans. So who controls virtual influencers? Behind each virtual influencer are clever creators, brands and individuals with a keen eye for technology who remain faceless. They're the ones responsible for growing the Instagram platforms and molding the virtual figures into the internationally recognized influencers that they're quickly becoming. So ultimate brand control. Unlike their human counterparts, every aspect of a virtual influencer's identity can be controlled. So they'll never behave in a way that's offensive to their sponsors, which makes them great tools for positive representation causes such as Black Lives Matter, LGBTQIA rights, battling climate change, and there's even one that is a bee who is um, campaigning to save the bees. Uh, ultimate flexibility. So virtual influencer can work from anywhere at any time, which makes them a real hot commodity because they've got no transport costs, no visa limitations, and in light of what's happened recently in the world, no COVID-19 restrictions. So they're very desirable to advertisers. Uh, they can be edited onto any backdrop that their creators want. So if they want to have an influencer that likes to travel, they just need a high res image of anywhere in the world and immediately the virtual influencer can tick that off their bucket list. So here's a, uh, one of our two case studies. So Lil Michaela was created by a transmedia studio called Brud and they were the first visual inf and was the first visual influencer to gain mainstream popularity via Instagram. So Lil Michaela now has over 3 million followers uh, is a recording artist with over 250,000 monthly listens on Spotify and also has a streetwear clothing line and has appeared in brand campaigns for Calvin Klein and Prada. So Brud creates digital character-driven story worlds and in response to Lil Michaela's success on Instagram, Twitter and SoundCloud, Brud secured $6 million in venture capital funding, subsequently creating two friends for Lil Michaela, Blauco, a self-proclaimed self low-life robot man, and Bermuda, an LA it girl and aspiring musician. The creators control the way that their characters look, dress, and act, but also 
who they interact with, which allows them to cross-pollinate between their different characters and gain more followers for each of them. Now we're moving on to Shudu, who is the most realistic looking uh, of the influencers we'll be looking at today. So Shudu is regarded as the first virtual supermodel. So she was created by photographer Cameron James Wilson, who taught himself 3D modeling using online resources and YouTube videos. He claims that Shudu represents something that he's always seen as beautiful, but something that he doesn't see often enough. Uh, Shudu has appeared in numerous advertising campaigns for Samsung, Balmain and Rihanna's makeup brand Fenty Beauty. However, there's been a huge backlash surrounding Shudu's use in such high profile campaigns because she's a very successful example of a white man not only profiting from uh, creating a black model, but taking up space that could also be filled by a real black woman in an already saturated industry and with an added competitive edge. So the creator observes, imagine if a real model was scanned digitally and then could work anywhere in the world at any time and do multiple shoots a day. Uh, so we've got an example of some of the backlash on Twitter to um, his creating of Shudu. Uh, your local sweetheart with a, a white photographer figured out a way to profit off black women without ever having to pay one. Now please tell me how our economic system is in no way built on and quite frankly reliant on racism and misogyny. And then a bit of a livelier one from Grace, hold TF on. So if someone made up a black model when they actually could have just hired a real life black one at your big age, trash. So moving on from that, uh, into body image, which is obviously closely linked to models. Um, in addition to concerns surrounding cultural appropriation and exploitation, there are also concerns surrounding body image. Human influencers such as Kim Kardashian have previously been critiqued for promoting certain beauty standard that enforces unrealistic expectations on their followers' bodies. Instagram actually began hiding digitally altered images in 2020 in a response to numerous studies, finding that young people's body image is heavily influenced by Instagram and the Advertising Standards Agency banned the use of misleading filters on beauty advertisements. In 2019, the retail and fashion industry made an approximately $3.6 billion investment in AI investments, meaning that CGI models will become increasingly more visible. Uh, currently, there are 148 different virtual influencers listed on virtualhumans.org, and that's growing all the time. So many in the industry have voiced concern about the non-realistic message that companies send out by using virtual models featuring the impact that normalizing CGI models bodies could have on consumers' self-esteem and body image. And that's really nicely illustrated here by Shudu's boyfriend, Coffee. Uh, so moving on to pornography. So these concerns surrounding body image also have a potential influence on things like porn, where exploitation is already a concern. When CGI humans inevitably become a staple in pornography, will a level of exploitation be removed? Or is there a danger of normalizing the more extreme behaviors that virtual stars will be able to perform? Social media and pornography already have some potentially damaging effects on teenagers, who according to a 2020 UK study, are increasingly turning to pornography as an educational tool because schools do not tell them what to do in early sexual encounters. The same study found that boys boasting about what they'd seen in pornography led to anxiety amongst girls about whether they could meet such expectations, as well as concerns about aggressive or violent sexual behavior. So on the theme of a concern for child safety, child protection. The increasing availability of CGI personas also has the potential to be misused by those attempting to groom children online. And that's usually people posing as other children. So this is, there's currently no legislation governing virtual influencers and their online interactions with humans. A great example of legislation racing to keep up with technology. This is currently at the discretion of their creators who have both vested interests in making money and conflicting opinions on how this should be handled. So the virtual influencer agency have been working to promote a code of conduct which would ensure that practitioners watermark any virtual influencer images and make it clear to their followers that they're not engaging with a real person. However, the creator of Japan's first male influencer, Liam Nakoro, sees it as more of a social experiment saying, among those virtual humans, there will be some where we will not tell the public that they are virtual. I'm very excited to see whether, human, whether fans will communicate with these virtual humans as if it's a real person. Continuing our dystopian journey into the world of virtual influencers, another concern surrounding this is the potential for terrorist organizations radicalizing and recruiting new members online. Once a lie is out there, attractions don't change the way that people feel about something, 
whether it's Pizzagate, a vote leave bus, or even a message not to vote. Uh, we've got a quote here from the Virtual Influencer Agency saying the risks are potentially huge. Take every issue we've had with social media, trolling, fake news, false information, issues affecting our psychology and our democracy, and times it by 100. Imagine engaging with characters controlled by governments on nefarious individuals telling you that things are completely untrue, telling you things that are completely untrue. And that takes us into politics and activism. So if a charismatic persona pushes a political agenda, it can have a far reaching influence, particularly when targeted at specific groups. Virtual influencers may be good for representation, but ultimately they have no actual affiliation. So no restrictions on what they can do morally or ethically, which begs the question, who's culpable when a guilty person is not a person at all? Without any legal parameters, virtual influencers like Cambridge Analytica are a political tool for sale to the highest bidder and have the potential to influence much more than just Instagram. And if anyone's interested in finding out a little more about any virtual influencers, there's some links at the bottom here for their Instagrams so you can join their ever-growing followers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elijah. I've got to say, hearing the phrase virtualhumans.org, I think just took all the breath out of my lungs. <laughs> uh, it's terrifying, isn't it? Yeah, and from reading the chat, a lot of people had no idea this was going on, and I, th I think I'm definitely one of those. Um, so we have a few questions. The first one from Haz says, this identifies a need for strict controls on how virtual influencers are used. Uh, who do you think should take responsibility for that, uh, creators or social media platforms? Uh, I think that um, the difficulty with policies as tech evolves so quickly and legislation is kind of struggling to catch up with that is that we live in a neoliberal society. So, um, you know, there's a lot of emphasis put on the individual um, rather than governments taking responsibility for things. But I think really it needs to be governments working in tandem with the creators and finding out a way that they can continue to make money from this whilst making it safe for the public as well. Amazing, thank you. Another one from B here. Um, quick question, do you think that potential issues with virtual influencers speak to a broad problem with how we use social media? Uh, I think that you know, the difficulty with social media is that um, we all want to look our best online. So, you know, whatever you're seeing on it is largely, you know, it's a version of reality, but it's not always reality. Um, and I think that, you know, the Kardashians are a really great example of this because whilst they have gained a lot of um, money and followers and all that sort of thing from being in the public eye and being so visible on social media, they then also become the victims of things like body shaming. So um, it's, it's kind of a, a bit of an Ouroboros in that respect that it's just sort of, a snake eating its own tail, and um, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult one. Mm. Thank you. From where there? And here a question Hi. from Poonam. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I did have a question about what other influencers, real life influencers, think about these fake companies, fake influencers that are produced by agencies taking the jobs that they built a following up to try and get? Um, has there been like conversation about that? Um, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I haven't looked into it um, that much from that side of things. Um, I think that, you know, there's definitely obviously been a backlash from um, models and, you know, that side of things. But I think um, if you look at the statistics of engagement values for, for virtual influencers, they are much, much higher um, than the real life people. So. I think, you know, if, if I was an influencer myself, I would definitely be concerned about being usurped by a robot at this point, I think. Yeah, definitely. And plus, and, you know, if, if um, everything's so controlled by the creators, you're never going to get someone in, um, in a magazine with, you know, a, a ring of shame around their armpits or, you know, some, someone saying that they've put on weight or haven't had a haircut post lockdown. You know, it's, um, it's just perfection all the time. So there's not really any reason for people to disengage with them. Yeah. That's an interesting question though, thank you. <laughs> cool, I think we've got one from Romy as well. Sweet. Yeah. Sorry, I'm so I'm so used to being on mute, I keep forgetting I have to unmute. Um, 
yeah I feel like for me do you think that this is kind of the start of the dark the dark side of technology and the dark side of the internet um, coming through have we taken automation too far um, are we actually going to get rid of human interaction and humans altogether <laughs> I mean I think um, there's there's a lot of sort of very compelling and very scary um, prospects for where this could go I think also I found out about it um, in the middle of re-watching Black Mirror which I think was probably um, <laughs> maybe a bit of an error um, but you know I think um, you know things like Black Mirror are really terrifying for for that very reason it's that they're you know they're so close to um, to reality where does that sort of tip over into um, into dystopia um, you know and I think particularly when the this whole point of a virtual influencer is for advertising um, are there any real sort of real benefits to anything outside of that or is it just potential dangers arguably you know I would sort of go with that really um, but our government's going to be willing to legislate against that when it's something that is going to bring a lot of money to companies and to countries then you know maybe not Wow. I just kind of just thinking here, you know, humans have a lifespan, do virtual influencers have a lifespan? Will they be, uh, I don't know, decommissioned at some point? I don't know what phrase you'd use for it. Uh, do you think, do you think that they have a shelf life? I don't know. I think um, it's an interesting question because um, there are some who have disappeared. And if you go on to the, the dystopian website, um, virtualhumans.org, um, <laughs> you can see a lot of um, dialogue around sort of, what's happened to this virtual influencer where's this virtual influencer gone um mm. so i don't know if it's just that they haven't reached the level of engagement they were intending to or um you know i, I suppose it could be myriad reasons why they why they drop off the radar but um yeah i think that the potential for um sort of foul play um is is definitely um you know thinking about sort of chatbots and that kind of thing even um if it's ostensibly a real person you're talking to um mm. i don't know sorry i've gone off tangent on on what you no, actually this is, asked this is great this is, this is really great <laughs> um, but yeah it's um it's fascinating because it's just such a terrifying prospect um and then you sort of if you think about um even the the idea of of music and recording as well and um you know um the one of the stars liam nakoro the um the first male japanese influencer who's completely CGI. Um, he has a recording career, um, just like Lil Michaela, but they've just taken some notes um, from one person singing and then they can just um, reproduce that ad infinitum really. So um, it's, yeah, the sort of the need for humans becomes increasingly less as, as the process goes on. Well, hopefully we don't just have to sit by while this unfolds to whatever it will end up being. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Elijah. This is this has really All opened right. a lot of people's eyes to this uh, this topic. Thank you, Doug. It's been so, a pleasure. Thank you so much. Brilliant. And next, we're going to move on to something perhaps more lighthearted. <laughs> uh, we have Liam, one of our tutors, come on to bring us into the wonderful world of maths and floating point numbers. Hello, Liam. Hello, Doug. How are you doing? I'm very well. How are you? Uh, I'm all right, thank you. Uh, before you go, can you please confirm to me that um, when I try and share my screen now that everything is showing up okay? I'll let you know, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, should we share the screen now? So any moments, there we go. Cool, That's I okay. can see the console log. Yeah, Perfect. take it That's away. Exactly what we want. Okay. Hello everyone, so um, in the spirits of, well, unintentionally, the fact that Elijah just spent a while chatting about um, considering the things that computers can do uh, and it, potentially some of the scariness around that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that perhaps computers can't do. So um, any fellow JavaScript developers will recognize this little line of code that I've got here, um, probably. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know, uh, the purpose of this line of code is to take the sum that we have in question, so that's that 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2 thing right there, uh, and is to work out the result of that and then show it back to the user. So it's pretty straightforward. It's just going to do that sum and then give us the answer. 
which of course we all know is 0 0.3. But when we plug it into uh, JavaScript, which is one of the programming languages that we use here at North Coders, we get this nasty looking thing. 0 0.3 with an awful lot of zeros after it's followed by a mysterious rogue four at the end. JavaScript has not behaved in the way that we would intend it to. And we would think of all the things that computers can do, surely it can do some straightforward arithmetic. We are shocked by the fact JavaScript is not behaving in the manner in which it is supposed to. So what I want to talk about today is why. Uh, so why is it happening? Uh, why is a computer doing this when such a simple task that we think computers are so advanced these days uh, and yet, here we are seeing such an obviously incorrect answer. The reasons are twofold. So I'm going to go through both of these points. And the first one, broadly speaking, is that decimals are hard. I'm sure many people um, harking back to GCC maths will sympathize with this. Decimals are hard. But more specifically, some decimals are particularly hard for computers. So to see what I mean by that, let's consider some of the decimals that we have in question. 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, as far as we can see, are pretty straightforward. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, a few digits, a couple of decimal points, job done. And we can kind of make sense of those ideas in our head. Let's move on instead to 1 third. One third feels relatively straightforward as a fraction. You know, we're all familiar with splitting things up between three people. Uh, and if we do that, if we do try and split things up into thirds, and we consider what that looks like as a decimal, what we end up with is this thing that goes on forever. So 0 0.33333, we would say, is a recurring decimal because it goes on infinitely. Uh, and it will always repeats itself with that mechanism. But I can never write it down on this slide, obviously, because there are infinite digits. And this is an issue, not necessarily for humans, because our human mind can kind of pass the idea of something that goes on forever without having to imagine every single three. Oh, there can be like, yeah, I get the gist of it. It's going to take that three, and it's going to repeat it, and every next three is going to have another three after it, and another three after that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the problem is, is that Computers don't quite feel the same. Humans might look at it and feel like, yeah, I get that. Computer is going to really struggle with something that goes on forever because my computer is probably only about one square footage of stuff, of hardware. And that hardware is limited in what it can store. My brain can comprehend it. My computer struggles. So if my computer can't comprehend an infinite number, of decimal places, what does it do? Because it has to do, it has to do something. We're probably at some point going to type the value one third into our computer. So we have to think of the question of what does it actually do when we do that? Well, one divided by three, as we know, is going to be 0 0.33333 and it's going to keep going on forever. But at some point that has to stop. So let's say for argument's sake that what the computer does is it decides that four threes are good enough for its purposes. Some point it has to stop. The point, the stopping point is arbitrary. In our example, we're going to say it's after four decimal points. So everything after those four is ignored. We lose it completely. And we have to settle on this compromise, or the computer settles on this compromise, rather, of one third just being 0 0.3333. Done. Which is OK. It's, not, it's actually not that far off being right. But problems quickly arise when we try and think about adding these sorts of numbers together. So if we take a third of something and a third and another third, and we add those together, a human might say, OK, if you have three thirds of something, that's a whole. Right? That's just one. But when I'm looking at it in computers' terms, I get 0 0.3333 plus 0 0.3333 plus 0 0.3333. And you may have to take my word on this. Uh, I, as I said earlier, decimals are hard. But if I do try and add those three numbers together, and feel free to verify this in your own phone calculators, um, what I get is 0 
which is most definitely not one. Which is a problem, right? Because we know for a fact that if you take one third plus one third plus one third, the answer is one. But here, we have not got that. We've ended up with something which is just slightly wrong. So when I say decimals are hard, this is what I mean. Which leads us on to the second point, because we haven't really addressed the fact that I introduced this mysterious tricky number of a third, but I said that 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 were fine. Right? We could we could deal with them. There wasn't really any, any trouble in kind of displaying them. I wouldn't need an infinite number of pieces of paper to write them out. But the problem is computers only understand binary. So binary is just zeros and ones. Okay. Humans use a base 10 number system. Base 10, because we have 10 fingers is where it comes from, and we have 10 digits. Okay, So 0 to 9 is our 10 digits, and we can use the numbers 0 to 9 in writing out all the, all the different kind of numbers that we want. But computers, what they work in is base 2, which is binary, where the only numbers they have at their disposal are zeros and ones. So when I go into um, when I go into my uh, software and I type in the number 0 0.2, and then when that software is run by the computer, what it has to do is it has to convert that number into zeros and ones, into binary. And what I end up with is this thing. When I try to convert 0 0.2 to binary, suddenly this simple number 0 0.2 becomes another recurring decimal. You get 0 0.00 and then 1100, 1100, 1100, again and again and again, all the way up to infinity. So as we established, because a computer does not have an infinite amount of memory, what it has to do is it has to find a point at which it stops. And in this particular case, in this programming language I'm discussing, we end up with this nasty looking thing. So it goes on for a while, admittedly, but it does stop. It reaches a point where eventually it's like, OK, this is as good as we're going to get. OK, for our purposes, this is as much as I can justify keeping in a, for a single number. This is as close a representation to 0 0.2 as I can get. But it's not perfect. Because if it were perfect, it would go on forever. It would be that 1100 repeated forever and ever and ever. But as we established, at some point we have to stop. So this then brings us finally back to what happens when we do 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2. Well, both of those numbers have to be converted into binary in the background. And that looks like this horrible thing, uh, which I'm obviously not going to read out. But this is what we end up with. And then um, things that we can't make sense of at all. Uh, I obviously had to plug this into a program to actually do this addition because that is there's a reason why humans don't read binary. There's a reason why it's a matter of language for computers and not for us. And we get this equally nasty looking thing. Again, feel free to confirm in your own time if you so wish. Um, and yep, that is indeed a bit of a nightmare because this is not something that we humans want to bother with. But this here this final binary number at the very bottom of my screen, when the computer comes back to us and it says, OK, this, it knows that a human has input the sum 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2. It wants to give the human an answer that the human can read. So it converts it back into those decimal numbers that we know and love with 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s, etc. And it converts it back to not exactly 0 0.3, but instead, 0 0.3 with something like 15 zeros, followed by a 4. Seems simple, but nothing is ever simple. <laughs> and I was kind of preparing this talk, uh, and I was kind of thinking about, you know, this is interesting to me, but like, what's, what's, the, what's the kind of point to this, I suppose? Like, what, what's, um, what am I trying to say with this talk, uh, if anything other than, um, I will take any excuse to talk about maths that I can get. And I guess it's even, again, made even more appropriate um, with the fact that Elijah just uh, did the talk about what, about what he did. Because I think the point here is that computers can do so many incredible, amazing things. And technology has progressed extremely far. 
Uh, and it is absolutely right that we keep check of how technology is progressing uh, and keep, um, you know, trying to keep on top of these things so that they don't get on top of us. But it's important to remember that human inputs cannot be undervalued, even now when technology has progressed to the point that it can. Computers can do amazing things, but our human brains have incredible, incredible capacity to understand the limitations of those computers and to be able to fill in the gaps. And I personally, and this is a complete opinion, think that it's going to be a long time before that changes. It's going to be a lot. Computers are ultimately limited by what we put in them. And I think that the human quality that we provide uh, in interfacing with that technology is going to be valuable for a long, long, long time. Uh, and other, anyway, that is my talk on um, floating point numbers, which is the fancy term for if you have to write decimals in a computer. If anyone wants to look into it more, they are called floating point numbers for reasons that are not interesting enough to explain. <laughs> yeah, thank you, everybody. You say it not interesting enough to explain, but I'm sure you can make it interesting, Liam. That was very interesting. <laughs> thank you. And props for writing all those ones and zeros so neatly. Although, uh, did you copy well, paste I, it for them? Um, <laughs> well, I can see that I've got a question <laughs> from Paul that says, how long did it take to write them all? Uh, well, I because it's a mostly a recurring decimal until a point at which it truncates, uh, I essentially wrote the four digits that it repeats and then copy and pasted them out. Um, yeah, but, cheating. <laughs> my, hand, my handwriting is so terrible that uh, I knew I wouldn't. I knew I wouldn't get away with anything legible. Um, yeah, I I never claim to write them all out. Um, yeah, I never claim to write them all out. Cool. And here's a question from Duncan. Can you read that off screen? Uh, yes, I can. So Duncan's asked. So I could see the issue with straight decimal points causing problems with financial tech. How is this dealt with? That's a great question. I I think it probably will depend on. Um, it probably will depend on who um, who is dealing with it, uh, and, and exactly what the kind of like what the importance of exactly what they what they're doing is. So one example is that um, what some systems do when they are dealing with money is they have all currencies be integers, be whole number values. So um, this isn't a flawless system, but essentially what they'll do is all American currencies will be measured in cents, and all British currencies will be measured in pence. So that they can effectively just subvert this problem. Uh, and this is a little bit tricky in terms of keeping track of conversion rates and stuff like that, because there are some currencies in the world that don't have decimal denominations. So then you'd have to like make that make that concession for some and not make that concession for the other. Um, so I think a bit a combination of that and also in in the in the wider sense, when people are doing complicated arithmetic, um, there are tools that you can use that allow you to be more precise uh, and allow you to kind of uh, make concessions for things like this. One of them that people generally say is just don't use JavaScript to, if you want to do maths. But that, to be honest, is, is not even just for this reason. It's just there's uh, lots of different tools in other languages that are more useful for doing maths. Right. I mean, is, is this issue solely uh, a JavaScript issue, or does it exist in other languages? Um, it's definitely not just a JavaScript issue. So I was curious about this, so I tried it out. And if you do it in Python, for example, an extremely ubiquitous language, and also a language that some people often recommend for its mathematical capabilities, you also get the same thing. And right. I, I tried it out in um, I tried it out in the language called Go. Uh, and in Go, yeah. what happens is it shows up on the screen as 0 0.3. But then if you give it a bit more, a few digits of precision, and you say, OK, show me what you've actually done. Show me what's under the hood. You get the same error. You get the same error. So oh, wow. again, this is a bit um, technical, perhaps. But for anyone who's interested, there's a standard for floating point um, digits for 64-bit floating point digits called IEEE 754. Uh, that's the kind of like um, framework for how to make floating point digits work in certain languages. And lots of languages do adopt that as a system for it. So if people want to, yeah, um, yeah it's a real catchy name. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to look into that, I'm happy to point you in the in the right directions to, to understand it more. Brilliant, thank you. Cool, thank you very much, Liam. No worries, thank you. Cool, and next up we have Poonam with a talk on tech in protests. Hello, Hello. Poonam. Hello. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good, I'm excited. Um, let me just yeah. share my screen. <laughs> Amazing. Whenever you're ready. Take it away. 
Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am going to talk to you about tech and protests, but I kind of lied. It's not really about tech, like in a broader sense. I'm very specifically talking about web apps and websites and open source code. And I'm not really talking about protest. I'm kind of talking about solidarity and not really frontline stuff. I did try to fit it in, but it was just so much. I just couldn't deal with it. So I cut it all out. Um, so, oh God, let me, all right. The first thing I would like to um, sort of drill home a little bit is that the right to join with each other in protest and peaceful assembly or strikes or unionize, um, march, everything like that is critical to a functioning society. And that's embedded in, I think, the US First Amendment right, and it's embedded in the European Convention for Human Rights. I hope I said that right. Um, so it's, it's what we need for a society that evolves and thrives. And basically we can't have a healthy society without it. Um, we can't have a democracy without it. Um, so I just wanted to draw that home first of all, um, because I think we kind of forget that nowadays that actually protest isn't something we need to squash or strike down on or have uh, heavy policies against. It's kind of something that we need to sort of support when we, when we find a cause that um, you know, we align with. Um, before we get into sort of the pro protester side, I wanted to see um, what was on sort of the state side in terms of tech. Um, and they focus a lot on like hardware that is very much focused on um, you know, blocking signals, collecting evidence, and just being downright like intimidating, like trying to capture everyone's faces kind of thing. Um, the guy on the left, <laughs> that's a guy in Russia. He's a he's a police officer in Russia, and he's using a signal jammer, uh, which I, at first I was like, what is this gun? But um, it's a signal jammer. And he's pointing at a, at a drone, and the guy in the, fog, the background, he's about to pluck it from the air because they're just disabling it. Um, and it's that kind of signal jamming, like advanced tech in that sense, that um, disrupts people on the ground and how they uh, communicate with each other and stay safe and uh, you know record evidence and stuff like that. We've got like police evidence gatherers and uh, this week in America has been very very turbulent um, for obvious reasons and um, there has been robot police dogs I think courtesy of Boston Dynamics in New York City. Not really sure what their purpose is but I saw an infographic about how to disable them which was very strange um, and on the top right hand corner I uh, saw a headline this week about um, a leader of the Metropolitan Police Union who was asking the government to take action against social media sites that allow people to uh, share images of or like videos of police on the ground. Obviously they're very aware that this kind of recording on the ground is uh, incriminating for them and um, yeah I'm not going to get into that but you can kind of see uh, they, they're very fearful of us having, well, protesters having tech and yeah, it's a weird situation. Um, so what about technology on the ground of protest movements? Well, I did have a lot to say about this, but I decided that uh, it's not worth getting into um, right now because there's so much of it. Um, there was one thing that I really wanted to point out was that uh, Telegram and Signal seem to become these like, you know, pillars of protest on the ground because they are end-to-end -end encrypted, self-destroying messaging services that allow massive group chats to be made. And the key point here is that technology and uh, apps like that, they're kind of able to democratize and decentralize and keep everyone sort of safe and well-informed on the ground. And that's the kind of thing that you see when you're, you know, on a march, like the whole aim is to keep everyone safe and informed and like able to move around um, and you know protect their identities and stuff. So let me move on to my favorite bit, which is acting in solidarity. Cause I don't, I don't go to protests. I've not really been to one. Um, my main acts of like protest have mainly been in solidarity to other causes or like from afar. So not really on the streets. Cause I think not everyone's comfortable doing that kind of stuff. And it puts different people in danger in different ways. So it's kind of something you have to think about. 
So solidarity um, and then open source. Um, so let me just explain a bit about what solidarity is. Uh, apologies if I butcher this and if anyone knows a bit more, but um, my interpretation of sol solidarity is that it's the, it's sort of like um, empathizing with the cause and you may not be directly involved or uh, impacted or directly in sort of that area that is, um, you know, feeling the harm of uh, a certain thing or feeling that cause more, but you're able to empathize or share resources or um, sort of share mutual aid or um, just sort of support in any way that you can, uh, despite being potentially an outsider to that uh, issue. So that's what solidarity is. And I think that solidarity is kind of, yeah, it's like grounded in education in my set, in my idea of it. It's sort of, if you take last summer where Black Lives Matter sort of took 2020 by storm because of some very, you know, unfortunate and continuing uh, police uh, violence against black people in, in America and around the world to be fair. Um, because of that, people were asking, how can I help? Where do I go? Who do I give money to? What do I sign? Who do I talk to? Who can I, you know, lobby to support this? And a lot of the people that have the answers are also the people that are doing most of the work and it can be quite exhausting. So <laughs> education is key because of all those questions. And then solidarity is key because it supports those people that are in the center of the storm and you know takes that pressure away from them and enables people to educate themselves and sort of give the power out and rather than focusing on like leaders that need to sort of direct everyone um so that's where open source comes in in my head um i saw a lot of web apps come through last year that sort of sparked my imagination a bit and i don't personally uh, contribute to open source at the moment i can't wait Oh my god, I can't wait. <laughs> so excited. I can't wait until it's possible um, for me or like I feel confident enough to uh, or I have time to because open source is where you can collaborate globally um, to create or like locally to create, um, you know, sites, web apps, tools, uh, software that can open pathways for other people. Um, and let me explain that a little bit <laughs> clearer. <laughs> Um, so this is uh, a web app called 2020 Protests, and it was created by, I think, a student in the US. And it came up just in May 2020 when everything was sort of kicking off. Um, and it's, it is what it says. It's a, it's a collection of the protests that are going on in America as they happen, where they are, what you can do to join them, how to keep safe, where to get educated on the issue, you know, who, who can you text to donate, um, and like a lot of love collections of resources. And this answers a lot of those questions that I mentioned earlier. And that's what I think can be really powerful. Someone taking the time to build resources like that, that point people in the right direction, allow more people to get activated um, as the issue sort of gains traction. And it just funnels people in the right direction. So I think it can be really, really powerful. Um, these were two uh, sort of informational web apps oh my god that is not visible but the one on the left is um it's eight minutes 46 seconds and that is the time that um Derek Chauvin who is now on trial uh he knelt on the neck of George Floyd for and it's a really difficult um timer to sit through it's got transcripts of what happened in real time uh, and it's emotionally provocative it means that people who may not understand the cause or may not uh, you know, actively connect with why this matters, why are people on the streets, why do they need to do this? And it forces them to sit in the shoes of those who deal with this issue every day. And I think that is the kind of powerful, like, uh, you know, open source uh, web app design we can do to educate people on why they should care. And then the one on the right is a uh, infographic. It's actually scrollable, it's not scrollable on the screen, but it is scrollable if you go onto it. Um, and it just shows you the scale of the incarceration state uh, in America. 
um, and just puts it into context. You know, numbers don't feel real until you see it, and you really do see it. And both of these are done by the same guy. Um, he's really interesting. Um, okay, so this is a a resource that I really loved because it was similar to the first one, um, an open source sort of updated um, bit of just a website, as simple as it looks, a load of links that um, point people to different directions, answers a load of questions. Um, and it, yeah, it does what it says. And I think this kind of design and this kind of um, you know thought process in uh, producing online uh, tools can be like insanely powerful, as I've said multiple times. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just really, really cool. And you can see on the bottom that it connects people globally, which was uh, yeah even better in solidarity. <laughs> um, and this is kind of the final thing that I wanted to show you guys. Um, it was just using Google Docs and PDFs to share things across the internet. You see how using all this technology? Um, and this is just sharing protest handbooks um, about how to keep yourself safe, how to utilize your mobiles like properly, how to um, you know clean your digital self so that um, people can't find out who you are as or you know incriminate yourself uh, if your country is particularly anti-protest. Um, and I just wanted to show that it can be as simple as that. And that's what I mean by, um, you know, software, software and solidarity. Um, so can you feel it? I hope that you can sort of feel a sense of what is possible when it comes to producing uh, open source or even just, you know, closed source um, web apps and online tools, just how simple it can be and how much of an impact it can make. Um, for courses that are really, you know, prominent in our modern times. Thank you for listening. <laughs> oh, Thank you so much, Funan. That was really, really interesting. Um, we've got a question here in the chat from Eva. Um, are there many ways, do you think, that tech can directly support protesters on the ground? You mentioned Signal as one, one thing, but are there other ways or other avenues? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, actually, a lot of the ways that i found are ways that we already know about. So we have you know, the messaging apps. Um, there are some uh, documents about the Hong Kong protests where they used AirDrop to communicate very quickly about what was going on on the ground in terms of like law enforcement and who was injured. Um, there was also kind of a, there's kind of a sort of use of social media that we, I guess, don't, I guess we don't take it for granted. We're very aware that the algorithm sort of lives on virality and um, we want to get images and videos out of what's going on, especially if there's brutality going on. Um, so I think one of the most powerful tools is social media and um, getting sort of like live streaming and stories and real time uh, you know, documentation out and getting it shared as widely as possible just to get people aware of, you know, if there's an abuse of power or if you know, a cause is you know, widely, um, I don't know the words, but you know, social media. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, one thought that I had was with kind of the the amount of funding that must kind of go into these kind of well, the police side of protesting. You showed these kind of robot dogs and these kind of signal jammers and all these equipment, which must cost like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pounds worth, if not millions. I, I, I don't know what the figures would be, but a lot of money. And yeah. you wouldn't you just wouldn't see that on on the protest side. You know, do you think that's a, an issue or do you think kind of open source is going to be enough to, to kind of I think um, I think that's kind of partly why we're seeing the kind of tools come out that they are like open source free accessible it means it's inclusive the fact mm. that so much funding goes into like state technology just means that uh, protesters have to be more fluid but I I do th I do see the issue that um, you know it's kind of a bit of a weighted scale. Um, but I think that that's where GitHub and <laughs> all those powerful tools mean that um, protesters can move more fluidly and not have so much financial distress if things go wrong, whereas maybe stateside it would be a problem. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. Another thought I had was, do you think that kind of bringing technologies into, into protests, which of course at the very base level would require maybe a smartphone or something, kind of brings in a, a buy-in almost to not participation in the protest, but maybe at least staying in the loop and, and making the, the most out of it. I don't know if that makes think, sense as a question, but what do you think about that? <laughs> I think I know what you mean. I think um, my interpretation of that question is that like once you're invested in terms of like, uh, you know, getting ready for a protest, getting into those comms groups, um, you know, emotionally investing in the idea that you're with an affinity group or something like that to keep yourself safe on the ground, that mm -hmm. can then, um, that can sort of then translate to when you're away from the event or if you feel like protest in the street is not for you or it ends, you still have those group chats, you still have those affinity groups, you suddenly have an online network that you can connect with and follow through on, um, you know, future events. So I think having that technological buy-in and finding that network is like, yeah, it's really good for like longevity in that sense. Mm. Cool, I believe we have a question from Elijah who's also in this call. Hello, um, I was just thinking um, about how interesting it is um, sort of the, um, the things that have come out of, of Black Lives Matter and um, how, you know, how great open source has been I just wonder if you think that um, with governments in some places becoming increasingly more authoritarian, if that's going to lead to actually companies starting to step up more, in you know, to defend people and sort of where you think that will go? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually think this, we're in danger of seeing the opposite happen. Um, as like Doug said, state has a lot of money and I think there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of legal leverage as well. And we saw in Hong Kong that um, there was an app that was used to track like police movements and keep everyone a little bit more informed. And it was very widely used, but then China, um, and allegedly, I don't know what happened, but China, <laughs> I think China uh, spoke to Apple and were like, you can't have this on your store anymore. Um, and Apple obviously like conceded because the powers are too great. I think the yeah. people, the people, it needs to be like a really large movement to hold uh, companies to account, especially top technological ones. As we can see, Twitter was a really hard slog to get certain people blocked. So, yeah, I think it's a really difficult one. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, Poonam. Thanks yes. for being with us. Thank you. And I think last of all tonight, we have another tutor of ours, Jim, come to talk to us about making Sudoku boring with wave function collapse. Hi, hi, Doug. Um, I just want to say, like, <laughs> it's it's real tough act to follow everybody tonight because everybody's been really good. So I'm going to try and um, talk about the kind of dystopian future of which is automation of puzzles. So. <laughs> So let me, uh, how did I, how did I end up talking about, uh, do you mind just holding with me while I check my screen share works just fine? Absolutely. How did I end up talking about quantum physics, uh, quantum mechanics and, um, yeah, you can see me and, uh, Sudoku. Okay. Well, I spent last weekend watching, um, infotainment on YouTube as usual, having a look at level generation for video games using procedural mechanics. And I saw what was people in putting an implementation of wave function collapse to create um, procedurally generated levels. Like normally to do something like this, it would probably take at least three functions. Uh, this first function here would would like work to the parameters that were designing some kind of cityscape, and the second one that were making an organic pattern, and the third one that were making like a like a dungeon type map. Uh, but these are all made with the same function, uh, which is, and I'm going to go. To, I didn't I didn't create this uh, this function, um, and I will see if I can get some links out into YouTube as soon as possible. But this has been created by. Um, 
remember this, it's here. And it's all using one function. It takes a small like bitmap image and uh, generates like huge, vastly different data based on it. And, and I, I watched this happen just like this and it blew my mind and I felt like I really needed to understand what was going on here. So it uses this notion of wave function collapse. Um, what it actually does is it, it takes a, an input image, uh, like the sample you'll see here in a second, like that, and then it breaks it up into loads of smaller tile sections. And um, each of those tile sections, it checks against its adjacent, like uh, tiles that are adjacent to it. And it creates a huge stack of potential existing tiles. And from there, once it's monitored all of the like potential adjacencies, it kind of builds it up. And then the output starts off as being all of those possibilities in a giant stack. The function's then gonna just pick one of those at random and then turn it into reality. And then from there, um, it'll propagate the information that something is, um, something's like being observed, something is that, and it'll propagate all the adjacency kind of issues and produces these huge things. Now I couldn't replicate this um, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not there yet. And the, the video that inspired me um, is actually here. And, and like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll post these links. Um, so what I thought was, how could I, how could I explore this notion um, in something that's maybe a little bit more relatable? So I thought, Sudoku, right? Fairly understandable logic. Every uh, row, grid, and column needs to have uh, possibilities one through nine. And um, you can only have one of each instance in those areas. So you could say that this blank Sudoku here, each of the cells has a superposition of simultaneously all being, it's, it's entirely possible that they're all the numbers one through nine. Um, so what happens then if we, if, we, if we collapse them? So I wrote a program that's going to do that for us. I can show it off today. So, mm -hmm, yep, this seems fine. So, so what this is going to do is it's going to generate a, a standard nine by nine grid, fill all the possibilities with the possibility being one through nine, and then it's going to take the one with the lowest entropy. And by entropy, it means the, the one with the fewest possibilities. And it's going to observe it like you would do. So pre-observed, it's kind of like a Schrodinger's cat situation. Um, it could be anything or it could be nothing. But as soon as we observe it, we have information that can, you can derive and, and pass out. So what happens here is it, it picks a number and then it updates all the possibilities. And we can see this happening and I put in nice colors. So um, it then picks the one with the next lowest entropy. And, and all of that populates out and you get this really interesting image of, um, of the Sudoku working itself out. Uh, I could make this faster. I probably should. It is what it is for now. Um, and you can see it's going gonna, it's gonna to fill itself out and, and, uh, and propagate all of that information to all of the connected cells. Uh, as each one is observed, it, it populates that information out to other areas and, and so on and so forth until we get a completed Sudoku. Um, so then I thought, what happens if I give it information? What happens if I take this possibility space and I populate some of it? So I went onto the internet and I found some Sudokus and I started with an easy one. Uh, da, da, da. Let me just quickly speed up this GUI a little bit. So what happens if we give it a pattern, and this is a standard Sudoku, it was taken off the internet, it was an easy one from, I believe, The Guardian, all the cells are pre-populated, uh, split by new lines, and it's going to show us. And I thought, like, 
how many, how many, so incidentally, 40 decisions it took to make this. 40 decisions it took. So how many would it take to solve this Sudoku? How many guesses would the machine make? So we can see it. First thing it's going to do is it's going to populate all the information and derive all the possibilities from that. Right? We can see that happening. We can see that the green sections are already some green things are already worked out. I was shocked because it just solved it. Done. There, there, are, there are no possibilities. So then I went for a, a more difficult option and um, and it, it broke. And, and that's when I spent my entire weekend learning how to um, how to how people actually solve Sudoku's so that I could apply it to this this weird solver using um, quantum mechanics. Uh, if there are any uh, quantum, uh, I'm going to go with mechanists. If there are any quantum mechanists in the the, the audience, I apologize for butchering this theory. But I went all the way up and I got uh, to a super fiendish one. And what's interesting is, if you remember the first pattern, it went really green really quickly. So it could work out a lot of things just by reducing the possibilities. I had to put in all sorts of different logic to say um, how to how to derive that information further. The more complex it gets. Uh, the more not decisions it has to make because all of this information is still derived, but the more time it takes to work out the next decision. So here we have much fewer stuff derived initially, and then as it fills that out, but it's still so quick. Everything's done. Now we're just waiting it to fill in the blanks. Um, so... What I will say is um, I'm not a Sudoku genius. I haven't um, programmed this entirely. It doesn't. It doesn't work exactly. It still there are still things that it needs to do that I need to teach it before it. I say teach it. I need to program an algorithm. I'm not using AI or anything like that. Things I need to program before it will. Um, before it will solve much more complex uh, problems. I've actually got note of one, save that, where it still needs to make a decision. Save, and uh, let me just open up in this, doo -doo -doo -doo. where's the code where it might make it make a decision? So it's gonna collapse the next wave here. It's gonna find the, this here. This is where we find out the decisions. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause it and save this so that we can see when it makes a decision, um, we can stop it and, and I can show you the derived information that we could do that I haven't yet programmed. So it's still working some stuff out. We've still got some information coming in here and it's getting a lot of the work. Now, if, if I let it make a decision, it's going to pick the one, the, the spaces with the least entropy. So it's going to pick at random something up here or down here where there are only two decisions to be made, right? But having, having spent far too long this week researching what, how to actually solve Sudoku's, the, the decision to be made is in these three cells here. It's not a decision. The information that can be derived is in here. These three cells... This one contains the possibility of it being three, six, and nine, this one three, six, and eight, and this one, three, and five. These three cells are the only ones in this area that contain the information three, six, and eight. So it's it's what's called a hidden triple. Um, so this information can only be in one of these three cells, which we can then infer this cell cannot have five or one in it. And if it can't have five or one in it, then this cell is the only one in this grid that can have five, and therefore we solve the problem. Um, if I leave it without making the decision, let it decide on its own, it could still come to the same conclusion. So let's find out. Or it could make an entirely wrong decision. I was going to spend some time working on like a backtracking algorithm, but I kind of like the idea that if it makes a decision and it's wrong, we get to find out. So it's got all the derived information. It's going to fill that in first, and then it's going to pick at random. 
Oh, I didn't save. My bad. Oh, please bear with me. Technical issues. All right, so giving the numbers, uh, they, they must be absolutely, like these these have to be either eight or nine, So uh, and these have to be two or three. So it, there's every chance that it could make the right decision here. But we'll just not find out until it actually works it out. Nope, there we go. You couldn't work out the possibilities. We failed. So it turns out, while you could possibly program a computer to do everything, um, sometimes it's, it's, it's arguably more effort than it's worth. Um, I hope that was interesting. Uh, that's, that's the end of this. Thanks. Doug, I love the fact that you're still on mute and you're waiting so patiently. Um, I could I could keep on talking, but you know. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share links to both this repo and the. Uh, oh, I'm the here. Right. Hey, Doug, I am going to share links <laughs> to those repos just so if you want to play and, and try it out yourself and see what kind of I, uh, spaghetti code I, I, I did, you, you're more than welcome to go see it. And I'll get those links out to you as soon as I can. Doug, sorry. Thank I, you. I, no, no, thank you, and thank you so much. Uh, will there be a version 2.0 with your uh, your decision algorithm, or was it the backtracking <sighs> algorithm? What did you say? Well, I think I think so. So I think what I because this is like a challenge to me now, right? I so I got to the stage where I could do easy ones, and it derived straight away, and then it moved on to the the more complex algorithms where there's just some more like derived logic that I didn't know, and I felt like oh, I could implement backtracking, or <laughs> I could implement this logic, <laughs> and then <laughs> I got through there, and it solves it solves super. Uh, I've got a, a puzzle from the Times. Apparently, that's a well-regarded um, newspaper for puzzles, and it's the super fiendish one, and it solves it not a problem. So it's just little tweaks, and every every time it's just more and more stuff to to keep it going. Uh, so yeah, maybe two point Who knows? Amazing. Thank you so much. And with that, we've reached the end of our talks. So I'm just going to invite everyone back to the screen. <laughs> so thank you so much, Jim, Romy, Elijah, Poon, and Liam, Bavna, and everyone at home from watching. Um, I've been Doug. This has been part of our lightning talks for the fifth anniversary of North Coders. So happy birthday, North Coders. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you can hear, there's some bass I've, I've been hearing for the past five minutes from uh, Hatch next door, the party's in full swing there. Um, so please, everyone, have a wonderful weekend. Thanks so much for joining us. If you do go out this weekend, please stay safe. Um, and yeah, thanks so much, and I'll see you all soon. Bye. <laughs>